Welcome to Useful Idiots. We were going to take next week off of the show, but we have so much great content for you that we're going to turn this week's episode into a two-part episode. So I had a very special guest co-host for this week, none other than Matt Taibbi. So what we're going to do is this week we bring you my chatting with Matt Taibbi, an interview with Matt Orfalea and Max Blumenthal. Then next week, Matt Taibbi and I are going to be bringing you a four basic food groups as well as a Thursday throwdown. So enjoy week one of this two week episode. And I'm so excited to be doing this with none other than OG UI Matt Taibbi. Welcome back, Matt. Thanks, Katie. It's great to be back. So we have a great show for you today. We have a double whammy show. Uh, and the focus is on censorship, right? What is it? It's like it is, yeah, it is. The, 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 there were two incidents this week that were involved relatively high-profile media figures uh, and involved internet censorship, and they both showed different angles on the problem. Yeah. So we're going to talk to both of these people. One of them, is, you know, is videographer Matt Orfalia, who works with my site, uh, used to work for Bernie. Uh, and then friend of uh, show Max Blumenthal, who, of course, Editor works of the gray zone. Uh, works with Aaron uh, right. the, at uh, at the gray zone. And, and they went what they went through, I think, is the scarier uh, situation. We're going to talk to him about that because, uh, well, we'll get into it. But, you know, the, these things are starting to tighten up quite a bit. This is a topic you and I haven't talked about a whole lot. Uh, since the Twitter files, but, um, right. you know, this is, uh, they both have horror stories to tell. It's both really interesting and, and look, looking forward to talking to them. Yeah. So without further ado, we're going to talk to our guests. Very excited to have joining us again, Max Blumenthal, editor and founder of The Gray Zone. How's it going, Max? Good to see you both. I'm doing well. By the way, can I inter interject? The last time you and I interviewed Max Blumenthal, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, one of its earlier acts, <laughs> demanded both of our firings. Oh, yeah. Right. Was that the center? Was that who it was? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. man. Well, it was yeah. so we were so hateful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a lot of hate going on. There was so much hate, yeah. And that was because we had Max on, right, on, uh, on this very show to talk about, among other things, getting arrested for- right. uh, Yeah, Matt, I- I actually right. had I had C Venezuela. I had CJ Hopkins on yesterday at Rockfin, ah. and we're going to post that on YouTube. But this is another person who's being accused of being a hate criminal in Germany. I mean, this not just surreal. accused, convicted. Yeah, convicted, sentenced to sixty days or thirty eight, thirty six hundred euro fine for uh, two tweets or a book cover and a tweet mocking the mask mandate in Germany. So, uh, you know, the term hate is being watered down as much as anti-Semitism at this point. Yeah. Uh, I hate but that. I'm... But I'm... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you say you're doing well, but but you're uh, also being uh, facing some difficult challenges right now. Tell us what's happening with the gray zone. Yeah, again, thanks for for doing this. Um, uh, it's important that we get the word out because GoFundMe has refused to tell our donors, what they're doing with their contributions. We've had over 1,100 people donate over $90,000 to provide long-term staff positions at the Gray Zone for three of the best and hardest working young journalists that have been contributing to our site over the years, Kit Clarenberg, Alex Rubenstein, and Wyatt Reed. And these are journalists, I'll talk about it in a minute, who have faced uh, state repression campaigns for their own work. And so we just wanted to to, to give them some stability and people came through for us. And then GoFundMe told me through some person named Sabrina, who could have been in a call center far, far away, that due to some external concerns, that was the exact language, they had put a hold on the money indefinitely and they would just keep us updated. They didn't keep me updated and they weren't responding to me at all. And so we basically had to pause the fundraiser because I couldn't in good you know, I, I just sure. felt terrible taking people's money, not knowing what was going to happen to it. And we'll also talk about the history of what GoFundMe has done and start to alert people that they should demand a refund, get their money back and donate elsewhere. And people are doing that now in the hundreds. It's happening. We are defunding GoFundMe 
and they are donating to us at a site called Spot Fund, which is kind of like Give, Send, Go. It's sort of like playing the role that Rumble is playing mm. with YouTube, where they're an alternative because you know these other sites have been captured by the security state or the censorship industrial complex. And they're uh, so far they've been very cooperative and trustworthy. So I'm 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 encouraged by the response and all the support we're getting from people, including people who don't necessarily agree with our politics. What's your, what's your sense of what these external factors could be? Kiev, London, Washington, that's where I would look based on our experience. Um, Kit Clarenberg, who we're fundraising for, was detained at Luton International Airport by British counter-terror police in May after getting off a plane which going to his home country, he's a British citizen. They put him in a small room in the airport for eight hours and interrogated him about his work for the gray zone. And this is work where he's um, used leaked documents to, for example, expose the influential British journalist Paul Mason as a security state collaborator. And, you know, being handled by someone inside the British Foreign Office, coming up with campaigns. Uh, working with the government on campaigns to smear the anti-war left, the Corbynite left in the UK. And I mean, that's one of many stories Kid has done. He's exposed the British blueprints to attack the Kerch Bridge in Crimea as well. But uh, he was asked about that, I believe. And I can tell you when me and Aaron Mate did our live stream about the Paul Mason scandal, on YouTube, YouTube gave us a strike and removed that live stream, or they they threatened us with a strike and said it was hateful content. So there's the hate again. Um, Aaron himself has been a, a target of state repression, um, and I think you you all covered this pretty yeah, thoroughly. Well, that was that was in the the, the, the Twitter, Twitter files. files. Yeah, yeah. So Aaron received a Twitter file showing that. The Ukrainian SBU security services, essentially Ukraine's FBI, went to the US FBI and said, can you get Aaron and all these other accounts off Twitter because we don't like what they're saying about Ukraine, Russia. And that was actually too much for the old regime of Twitter, which loved to cancel people. They said, we can't just cancel or ban Canadian and American journalists because of their opinions. But it shows that the FBI was willing to collaborate with a foreign government on censoring Americans and Canadians. And then we have uh, Wyatt Reed, who was banned by Venmo and PayPal, financially sanctioned, like we and other entity, uh, you know, groups and activist causes have been by GoFundMe. A month after he reported from the separatist side of the Donbass on Ukrainian attacks on civilian targets, including his own hotel, which was shelled by a US made howitzer while he was 100 meters away. So we have this history of being targeted. I can go on and on and on. I mean, Anya Parampil and Aaron Mate are on the de facto Ukrainian kill list known as Mirot Foretz, which was maintained by the Ukrainian Interior Ministry. I've been doxxed by a Ukrainian group called Molfar, which is connected to the foreign ministry and based in London. They sent out a dossier on me to hundreds and hundreds of journalists, any email account they could get. And it contained my home address, the address of my, addresses of all my family members, um, and alleged that I was, you know, being, um, becoming wealthy thanks to uh, Putin. And so that would justify them doxing all of us. So, I mean, that's who I think is responsible for this and this time, like some combination of those elements. And if we look at what happened with the Canadian freedom trucker, the freedom convoy, right? Um, the d near theft of $10 million and 10 million Canadian dollars, that was all under Canadian state pressure. So I think it's really the state that they're responding to here. And it speaks to the wider problem that, Matt, you've been testifying to Congress about where the First Amendment doesn't apply when some private corporation is fronting for the national security state without and the national security state doesn't acknowledge what it's doing. It has no fingerprints. So all we're dealing with, it's like CJ Hopkins said, uh, you know, this isn't a jackboot stomping on your face, stomping on the face of humanity. It's a uh, faceless Silicon Valley corporation 
acting on national security state orders to shadow ban you quietly out of existence. Hmm. Yeah, and and the shadow ban, remember, even a year ago, Twitter had put out a, uh, an announcement called um, setting the record straight on shadow banning. <laughs> and our, uh, I remember the, the first line was, people are asking us if we shadow ban. We do not, right? So as recently as a year ago, you know, the, these companies were denied that they did anything like this. We now know, obviously, that they do. And be, as a result of a whole bunch of things, the Twitter files is, is part of that. But there's also the Missouri v. Biden suit. You know, there have been some FOIA requests that have come for, through that have been... Um, very influential, but your your case uh, and Aaron's case, I, I thought was the clearest indication of uh, you know a true uh, effort by the security state to interfere in content. Um, I mean the 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 arrogance of passing on a request by the SBU to a company like Twitter. And saying, you know, outright, we would like this to be removed. I forget what the the language directly was. As discussed, I'm including a list of accounts um, from the security services. These are uh, suspected by the SBU of spreading fear and disinformation for your consideration, right? Yeah. Um, so they're not being coy about it. This is the FBI forwarding a foreign intelligence agency's request to remove a Western account. That's incredible. And clearly what's happening, I think, is that you get on a list that just circulates uh, among all of these companies after a while. And you, you guys are clearly on that, that list at this point. I mean, I that's the thing is we have no transparency. We only, the, the, Our only way of fighting back, our only recourse is uh, we find some friendly billionaires like Elon Musk who are willing to tell us what happened or there are leaks uh, as you know, and, and, and some entity like WikiLeaks puts them online or we obtain the leaks. Um, but there's very little recourse here. And that's why the national security state prefers this, this model. It's kind of a totalitarian neoliberal model where the public has absolutely no due process, no say, and no way of knowing who is banning them out of existence. And they're, they're just full speed ahead. Their foot is heavy on the gas right now, taking us into a, a technocracy, just a hard technocracy with the illusion of liberal democracy. And uh, I think the best you know, the, the, the best mechanism we have for pushing back is what we're doing right now, which is that we're going to some alternative Silicon Valley company, but it's still the same neoliberal model. Um, you know, we found the good guys at spot fund and I really do. I mean, I am grateful to them on, at least on a temporary basis for helping to get us out of this mess, but it's like, everyone's going over to rumble and we're being encouraged to go over uh, to locals because Patreon is more likely to ban us. But that's not a solution. That's not a way out of this. Uh, we need more transparency. I mean, the House Weaponization Committee, it's no church committee, but it is uh, one of the few times I've seen the government actually act to provide transparency on what's been taking place, especially since 2016, when in her first public address since uh, losing, I guess it was 2017, since losing to Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton blamed fake news and Russia for uh, you know, the, the threatening our democracy. In other words, electing Trump for the rise of populism. And that's when I knew that we were going to face a tidal wave of sophisticated censorship. And we did. So what's what's the significance of what what's happened with your case versus what happened in the Canadian truckers case? Because there, at least there was some kind of predicate. I, I was bogus, I thought, but at least they said there was a reason uh, for what they did. Right. And this and this time they're not even bothering, it seems to me. Well, they never really say what the reason is. They said that uh, they their terms of service ban violence and hate. 
And the Canadian truckers were being accused constantly of violence and hate. Remember there was the guy running through the street with a swastika flag with a face mask on and like no one could identify who it was. It looked like such an op. And then, you know, the truckers, their presence was seen as violent by many people because they're blowing their air horns right there in downtown Ottawa. Is, everything's violence now. Like this is literal violence. But they were also having, you know, hosting moon bounces with kids. Lots of families were there. Um, there was a commission uh, of inquiry on the truckers and found no incidents of violence. They were accused of being armed. There's no evidence for that. They were accused of being foreign funded. There really was like like big donations, millions coming in from south of the border. There was none of that. The Biden administration was openly working with the Canadian government on imposing the Emergencies Act on Canada to authorize the theft of the Canadian money and the, and the money going to the sorry, truckers. Were, the, can you just set up what this was? This was money that- yeah, yeah. The, no, I've done a really bad job of setting no, this no, up. No. Let me start over. Okay. okay. Um, the Canadian Freedom Convoy was initiated, I think in January of 2022, driving f- across Canada with massive public support to send a message to the liberal Trudeau administration that Canadians were sick of the lockdowns um, that had just driven lots of people into financial ruin and insanity. I mean, imagine being locked in your little apartment in Toronto for months on end in the cold weather that they have to endure. And the vaccine mandates, which were preventing the truckers from working um, and also from crossing work, the border. Or crossing the border. Um, which is really important for Canadian truckers. And so they brought their trucks into Ottawa, into downtown Ottawa, to the site of the federal government and blow, blew their air horns and brought in all their supporters. And the Canadian government panicked. They had no idea what to do. So they uh, announced the Emergencies Act, which allowed them to basically declare martial law and bring in the federal police to remove them. And they s- o- ordered GoFundMe as well as Canadian banks to seize donations to the Canadian truckers. GoFundMe seized close to 10 million Canadian dollars. And then what it did was it announced that it was donating that money to quote, established charities. So money was being stolen from thousands and thousands of people to donate to uh, charities that they didn't approve without their consent. It was a straight up unwarranted theft ordered by the government. And it showed how sleazy GoFundMe was. And it was only thanks to Republican lawmakers in the U.S. threatening GoFundMe, which is a U.S.-based corporation, that they agreed to return that money. And they never really explained any of this except on the grounds of hate and uh, violence. With us, they never explained anything at all except they said external concerns. And they, they kept us in a kind of gray zone where they didn't say, we refuse to work with you, we're banning yeah. you, which is what they did to Mint Press, another anti-war outlet. They just- That was, that was, that was last limbo. year, right? Was that year, last year, year before? Yes, it was last year. Consortium Mint Press too, just right? Been, they've just been banned from TikTok, by the way, and another uh, anti-war site, a Middle East-based site called The Cradle has been banned from Facebook. No one gets any explanation. We got no explanation. And we weren't going to allow them to just keep us on hold for a month or two months. And so we kind of pulled the plug. So what happened to all the money that, so in the Canadian case, the convoy, people got their money back. In your case, what has happened to the money so far? People are getting refunds okay. and uh, it will all be refunded. They have to refund it, especially because you know they haven't banned us, um, but it would be you know, they would face legal, serious legal action if they attempted to steal it. And I think they showed with the Canadian truckers that they can't steal the money, but we, they also showed that they would be happy to do that. Right. Yeah. I mean, there've been, there've been some episodes where it hasn't been entirely clear at all that the money would come back. I mean, cons- consortium and press, it was small amounts of money, but you know, they, they didn't indicate that they felt that this was particularly obligatory on their part. But can, can you talk a little bit about the problem of um, of taking money or I- impacting people's ability to invest or donate 
as opposed to just censoring speech, because right. it seems like a, yeah. a, a serious escalation of, of the issue. But at the same time, you don't get the normal like watchdogs of censorship concerned with it necessarily because they don't necessarily think that that's their within their purview. I mean, I think that uh, the 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 watchdogs of censorship when they showed how worried they were about Substack were concerned about people who are unauthorized with unauthorized views or um what was the language Justin Trudeau used? Uh, dangerous views. Oh, uh, unacceptable views that they unacceptable. are holding that they are holding. Or yeah. they're having, yeah. Yeah, unacceptable views are able to fund themselves independently outside of uh, media, legacy media institutions like you, Matt. So we depend on a grassroots audience to, uh, to finance what we're doing, to pay our rent. And, or like we just sent Anya Parampil to South Africa to cover the BRICS conference. We were one of just a tiny few alternative or independent outlets that was covering what we think is a historical event um, that really uh, was a pivot point in, in history. And we were able to do that thanks to our audience, but we can't just tell our audience, uh, you know, can you send a wire to this address? It's, it's too complicated. It's, it's so much more convenient to just push a button and uh, you know we can communicate with them through these platforms like Patreon or GoFundMe, and so it's a natural target for the censorship industrial complex just to make it harder for us to finance ourselves. I mean, and, and then to target individuals like Wyatt Reed, so that he, it's hard for him to get paid. It means that to the extent that they are being controlled by the state, which they are, that the same sanctions regime that is sanctioning like one third of the world's population is now targeting citizens within the West and sanctioning them for their unacceptable views. That's what we're dealing with right now uh, is financial sanctions, but they won't take responsibility for it the same way that you know, the Treasury Department will announce sanctions, new sanctions on Iran. So there's no due process. There's no legitimacy to it. It's pure cowardice, actually, on behalf of the state to not face the citizens who's, who, who, whom they're trying to ruin. Why, why won't they do that? Why won't they take accountability for it? Because then the entire propaganda model starts to fall apart. They need to convince the majority of the public that they live in a liberal democracy where there is due process and where citizens have full rights. Um, and that to the extent that they're being banned from some platform, it's simply because they violated the terms of service of that private entity. And hey, it's a free country. A private entity can do whatever it wants. But once the public influence or the state influence comes out, then the liberal democratic model of propaganda, which Sheldon Wolin called inverted totalitarianism, begins to unravel before the public's eyes. And then the public begins to rebel. Max, why do you think... What what happened to the old sort of ACLU crowd that <laughs> once upon a time w would have complained about all this? Because in addition to all the censorship stuff, and I know people have different feelings about that, but it's leaning on companies like PayPal or payment processing companies, credit cards, uh, credit card processors, uh, advertisers for companies like Amazon. It's it's the relentless kind of seeking out of pressure points financial pressure points to clamp down on any kind of expression. It's it's not getting any of the blowback that we would have gotten 15 years ago. Where, where did that go? Uh, totally. I mean, I was, it's like the same, I, mean, I have the same reaction I did to the ACLU supporting the COVID mandates, which is that they've been completely bought off and that the progressive left of today is not the progressive left that I even knew during the Bush era, but certainly not the progressive left of the 60s or 70s, which saw civil liberties as paramount. Because without civil liberties in a society like ours, they could no longer organize. Um, they're just bought off and they're part of a kind of NGO class that acts as a urban cadre for the financial elite. The ACLU in DC uh, Washington, D.C. is heavily funded by Bill Gates, who was a financial beneficiary 
of the vaccine mandates because he was heavily invested in mRNA technology. Um, but well, he's also just not someone who has any idea of what's happening with regular people. And he also is a sponsor of the censorship industrial complex. He funds all of the, the, the established fact checking sites, which only come in to check facts when somebody contravenes the objectives of the elite, um, like pointer or Snopes or any of these entities. So, I mean, the ACLU doesn't care about this. The ACLU is fighting like what Ron DeSantis is doing, which I consider in many ways unconstitutional. Um, you know, the book bans, a lot of the flagrant culture war campaigns that he's running there. Ron DeSantis is proud of what he's doing. He doesn't make any secret about it. What we're facing is so much more insidious, and I think it's such a greater threat. I think the radical center is a far greater threat to uh, the Constitution than the radical right because the radical right is cartoonish and it's it's easy to mobilize opposition to them but what the radical center is doing is it's is is something that is emanating from the heart of the national security state it's completely opaque and they have all the power and they are determined to impose a technocratic undemocratic system on us from behind the guise of liberal democracy i just don't think the ACLU has any financial incentive to challenge it, but I actually see them as in a, in a, in a certain way part of that system. All right, how about coming at it from the other end? Like we do have these big companies, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, uh, trying to think of some some others, but the, the there there is a sort of an economic liberty principle right here that once upon a time would have very much appealed to the establishment. Republicans. Is that why they're on board with this stuff now? Or, I mean, I, I'm not seeing that outcry so much either, which is another odd angle to the story. Like, what's going on there? Well, I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding, but I think what what we're seeing with this kind of financial censorship is the contradiction in the talking point that Republicans have have flung for pretty much my entire life about economic liberty, which is that the state can exploit economic liberty to erode civil liberties mm. uh, and the constitution. And that, you know, when the, when uh, the public square our you know, Hyde Park speakers corner becomes the digital commons and the digital commons are entirely privatized. Citizens have no speech rights. And so to the extent that Republicans want to remove in, in, when they, when they, when they want economic liberties to be completely untrammeled, they're removing uh, the public protections that we have in the constitution. Like when corporations just take over everything. I mean, people, people scarcely use telephones anymore. Facebook, and, and this is something that's true in the inner city, especially young people use Facebook as their telephones. So they're, they're tapped, they're surveilled. Uh, police are using uh, Facebook conversations, including those apparently that, you know, come through signals intelligence to arrest young people and accuse them of gang activity. And they have uh, no recourse or protection from that. They have no privacy. And that's something that was guaranteed under the Constitution. But the Constitution is just like a sideshow at this point. Yeah, it doesn't have very many champions, does it? Yeah. Um, what has champions? I mean, they the Republicans all say we support the Constitution, but they've created the context along with the Democrats, but more aggressively for the erosion of the Constitution or for putting the Constitution on the sidelines because of the way we communicate. I mean, Bill Clinton bears responsibility too for the Federal Communications Act of 1996. I mean, all of the liberalization, financial liberalization of the communications market has set the stage for uh, the censorship industrial complex to come in from behind the scenes, from behind the curtain and censor us without anyone knowing that it's the government doing it. Well, there's a bigger picture behind be, behind all of this. It feels like to me, which is a desire for um, on the government and among the government and other folks to 
keep the public from knowing what's going on in the Ukraine theater. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what the gray zone would like to report about that or what it already has reported and what you think people are not hearing about that? Well, I mean, Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine and his wife, Olena, personally intervened to prevent me and Aaron Mate from speaking about the Ukraine proxy war and from slamming NATO at the largest gathering of the tech industry in the heart of NATO in Lisbon, Portugal uh, last year. So that pretty much speaks to the outside or the, the, the um, external concerns that GoFundMe referred to, to justify freezing our money. I mean, it's coming from the top in Ukraine. And Zelensky himself is, was is in many ways just a puppet of the US. I mean, our reporting speaks for itself. We, and we're a small entity uh, with a fairly large grassroots audience, but the way that the, the military industrial complex, the, the national security state, the empire sees it is that any penetration of or disruption of their narrative is a critical threat and it has to be suppressed. And that our role is to talk to our friends and our comrades in a little echo chamber and to never be heard by anyone else. Um, that's why, you know, you, when you all were at Rolling Stone and you hosted me on the White Helmets at a time when Syria, the Syria proxy war was still simmering, um, just any discussion of that was met with this out of control, hysterical response and calls for your firing. And yeah, I'd letters. never seen anything like that before. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and of course, who, who was fronting that campaign? It wasn't the State Department. It wasn't, uh, you know, the Syrian opposition. It was not anything that could be identified as a government entity. It was what the Center for Countering Digital Hate and a letter by a bunch of um, sold out fake left wing academics who support regime change. But it's just like it's a that's just the, the patina for the cold hand of empire. To hear the rest of our interview with Max Blumenthal, please subscribe at usefulidiotspodcast.com. And now here's part of our interview with Matt Orfalea. All right. Welcome to the super fun portion of the show. As mentioned before, we have a, a couple of guests who've, who've uh, been through some gnarly internet censorship issues of late. None other than Matt Orfalea. Uh, if you have watched funny videos at all in the last five years, you've almost certainly seen his work. Um, he does work among other things for my site racket, but he's all over the internet and, uh, has an interesting, uh, biography, uh, Katie, I'm sure, you know, this Matt got his start, uh, got part of his start working for your favorite person in the world. St. Bern, St. Bernard. Right. Huh. Right. So for people who don't know you, Matt, can you tell, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, um, I just like editing videos and uh, making videos. And uh, originally it was just comedic stuff on YouTube. Then I, in 2016, I listened to the Bernie Sanders uh, stump speech and I, I got into it and I saw there wasn't, you know, there was an obvious slant against him. And uh, I thought I'd help. I tried to help me by making videos. Anyway, uh, some, the videos did so well, they did better than the official uh, Bernie campaign. Uh, in 2020, they hired me uh, to be a creative editor for them. Uh, that came to an abrupt uh, end when they realized that I have a history of creative editing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's that story. Uh, luckily, um, you know, on my resume, I could say, it, it, I don't just have, you know, Fired by the Bernie Sanders campaign, or I can say hired by Matt Taibbi. So thank you for that. I'm very well. Not only uh, that, but you you have a very successful you have sort of independent YouTube channel on, on your own, and that's part of what makes the story we're going to tell today so upsetting, because you're 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 among the sort of group of people who uh, has carved out a, a, a living doing this, you know, 
creating video content for YouTube, which is precisely what they wanted you to do, right? This this was the whole idea behind behind YouTube, wasn't right. it? Yes, yeah, it was to give everybody in the world a voice, like just totally in line with you know what everyone sees as like ideal democracy, everyone having an, a voice. Right. So can you tell us what happened? Uh, well, recently, um, well, first I'll give a quick- uh, Yeah, we gotta go backstory. back in time a little bit, yeah. <laughs> So they, um, you are probably familiar with uh, YouTube's policy of removing, like literally deleting videos that just question the integrity of the 2020 election. So I did not make a video that, that did that, but I did um, document uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump's history of questioning election integrity. And I just, you know, put, put both side by side in a quick little uh, mashup comparing the two, and it got removed under their election misinformation policy. Just so people know, like an, an example of the kinds of uh, kind of thing that would be in there would be, um, you know, Hillary Clinton saying Joe Biden should not under any circumstances concede, right? And then there would be a countervailing clip from somebody else or. What was the one that had horror in it? That was an interesting one. There were, there were two oh, clips of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, well, you had uh, Donald Trump describing how, you know, rigged the election, the 2020 election was. Goes, it's a horror, an absolute horror. And you have a Democrat, uh, rep, Representative Jackson, I believe, on the House floor, you know, questioning the integrity of the the vote, just similarly to the house and the Republican house in January 6 saying it's 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 a horror it's a horror like the the lack of election integrity so very uh <laughs> there's just a lot of uh, parallels there and anyway it got it got deleted and in June of this year YouTube removed their policy of deleting those videos uh and instead now they just demonetize it um Anyway, when I learned that they weren't deleting the videos anymore or said they weren't, I decided to just test it out myself and re-upload the video, see what happens. To my pleasant surprise, or to, well, to no surprise, it was automatically demonetized, but I appealed it and it passed the appeal. Human Review found it totally suitable for advertisers. They, so they, when, they even said that, right? That's right. I got an email notification saying uh, there was no issue anymore. Great. And I reported it in June. And then recently, I noticed, though, that it has been altered to be in violation of their harmful or dangerous acts policy. Uh, and so it's now demonetized under that. And I was never notified by that. So, it, so I had a human review that I was notified about in June. That is totally all good. But at some point, and I don't know when... It was re-reviewed by some anonymous human reviewer to be not suitable and harmful or dangerous. <laughs> so we reached out to you too, but we're waiting to hear, you know, something hopefully. <laughs> yeah, and and look, the 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 reason this is significant is because yes, you, these companies obviously can make decisions if they feel like it. I I don't love it, but. They're private companies. If they, right. they want, if they want to decide to, for instance, uh, deamplify or ban questioning the election, um, they can do that. But that's not what was going on with this video. Matt, his specialty uh, and his particular flair as an editor is that he he sort of comically arranges real public statements right. of officials there's no fake news in there there's no there's no trick editing to add anybody saying something that they didn't it's just x said this y said that a said this b said that and putting it all together and and so for them to put that you know something that's true and describe it as elections misinformation we we originally protested that and said it can't possibly be misinformation if it's if it's real material exactly. they they agreed with us last year uh and now they're creating a new standard which is well there's two things that are dangerous about it in my opinion i'd be interested to hear 
your reaction, Matt. For one thing, this whole idea of, of creating a harm standard, right? Now, now something doesn't have to be misinformation. Now they can just call it harmful uh, and say that it could lead somewhere bad. Yeah. And then the other thing is they don't have to tell you when yeah. they've made these decisions. And Matt found out about it by accident. Yeah. How uh, did you find out about it? Just looking through my YouTube library. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I thought that was, you know, not demonetized. And so I just click on it, view details, and the details have changed. <laughs> yeah. So without notification. But but so as as a content creator on YouTube, what does it do to your thinking? Right. I mean, how how often does it enter into your thinking that I can't use this or that because this is gonna end up triggering X policy or Y policy? Well, uh, me, it, um, I like to think it doesn't affect me as much because I still keep making the content, but it, it probably does to some degree. And that, that's the whole purpose. I mean, Susan Wojcicki, she said straight up, like the purpose is to, to, you know, disincentivize this kind of content, borderline content. This is another thing that you do, which is particularly problematic in the, in the new content moderation schemes is the the algorithms can't tell the difference between commentary right. reporting and endorsement all right so you know we've had other people for instance who've shot video of somebody like richard spencer sold that video to pbs but then found that their own footage gives them a strike when it's uploaded to their own site mm. so do you have to worry about those distinctions too? Like, do you have to announce this is satire or announce this is history or, or what do you do? <laughs> and to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiotspodcast.com. That was interesting. It, it, it's horrifying, actually. I mean, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, isn't that I, horrifying? This week on Isn't That Horrifying? Yeah. We we didn't get to it as much as I wanted to in the Twitter file stuff because but it came up repeatedly this whole question of leaning on payment processors right. and other companies. Uh, uh, about a year ago, I did an interview with a porn star, believe it or not, yeah. who, who talked about um, how the credit card companies now basically can control what sex acts you can perform uh -huh. uh, on the internet. And that's because of pressure that the credit card companies are getting from various groups. That's the model that is now being used for politics. And people have to understand that this is going to reach into every corner of everybody's life because, you know, we do everything on the Internet now. Right. Yeah, it is scary. It's terrifying. But, yeah. you know, people are noticing the, the, the gray zone thing. So that's good. Yeah. But you know, it's like, th that's great. And it's great that they've been so successful. But if you have, if you're not as high profile and something like this happened to you. Well, that's what happened to Mint, Mint, Mint Press and, right. and, and Consortium, you know, yeah. they're just out of luck. Yeah. yeah. So it's awful. That was a great interview. And um, thank you guys for watching the show and make sure that you join us at usefulidiotspodcast.com. We have a new URL, usefulidiotspodcast.com com because that's where you get the extended interviews and the extended feature which is uh thursday throwdown your midweek dose of media madness and thanks for returning matt thank you katie hello thank you so much for listening to and watching useful idiots for full episodes and extended interviews please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com you can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash useful idiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at useful idiot pod and use the hashtag useful idiots pod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the useful idiots Monday morning show where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. <laughs>